2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, I was thinking about what Paul said in verse 2, where he tells the people that he did not want them to be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, either by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that the day of, it says Christ, it means the day of the Lord has already come, has already started. These people had gotten some misinformation. You know, there's a lot of misinformation that's floating around today. Have you noticed that? And which, which says to me, we always need to be careful and investigate to make sure that we're not falling for a lie. Let me give you an example. At the heart of all this current hate and chaos and evil in the anti-Semitic protests that are going on in our city and in other cities and universities, there is a satanic lie about Israel. And that is that Israel is an occupier. Well, I want to tell you, and if you've been here at Bethel for any length of time, you know that that is is not biblically true, nor is it historically true. And so we need to really know what the truth is. There are some here in this church in uh, Thessalonica that had been deceived into thinking that this day of the Lord had, uh, that they were living in it, that it had already begun. Now, the day of the Lord, let me just explain what that is. The day of the Lord is a period of both judgment and blessing. The day of the Lord actually uh, begins after the church is raptured, and it would include the 70th week of Daniel that we sometimes just call the tribulation period, that seven-year period, but it also includes the millennium, the day of the Lord. So it's a time of both judgment and blessing. But these people had been deceived uh, through some, I would imagine, prophetic utterance in a meeting that uh, they had attended, or uh, I get the impression in that second verse that perhaps a forged letter a letter that was uh, uh, that had Paul's name attached to it, but it wasn't written by Paul. A letter claiming from Paul, c- claiming that it came from Paul, that had led these people to that false assumption. Well, what he says in verse two is pretty amazing. When he uses that phraseology, "shaken in mind," he means to be excited, to be violently disturbed. What it means is when the church believed that lie regarding the day of the Lord, they were just immediately and really on a continual basis, they were rocked with fear. And 2 Thessalonians is actually a book that is written to calm their fear and also to give them understanding. The section that we're looking at today, these first 12 verses in this uh, second chapter, has uh, information, has truth that is contained nowhere else in our entire Bible. And there are three things that this chapter and these verses tell us about the day of the Lord. Three things that have to take place before the day of the Lord will ever begin. And this is the way he calms their fears. You're not in the day of the Lord because this, this, and that didn't happen yet. Well, what are they? I want to share it with you as we pause a moment for prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that your truth is clear and we don't need to panic. We thank you that you have given us enough information in our Bibles, to live successfully in these days of upheaval, of trouble, of evil. Lord, we ask that we would not fall for the devil's lie, but rather that we would look into the scripture 
and that we would uh, study the scripture and that we would know it well enough not to be deceived, not to be caught off guard and be able also to counter the lies of the wicked. We thank you for this passage this morning and pray that you'll mightily use it in our hearts and lives for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what's the first event that has to take place before the day of the Lord can begin? And uh, specifically, the part of the day of the Lord that we're referring to is the part that has to do with God pouring out his judgment upon this earth. They thought because of the severe persecution, the harsh, cruel uh, reality of their lives as believers, that the day of the Lord had begun. And of course, it, it was uh, told them that that's exactly what, it, what was happening. Well, look at verse 1 with me. And you'll find the first thing that has to take place before the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment on this earth, the seventh week of Daniel, that seven-year period of tribulation could begin. He says, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming or by the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our, see that word, gathering together unto him. That's a key word. When you just read that first verse, even if you haven't read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 to 18, you become very uh, clearly aware of the fact that the Apostle Paul and the people that uh, gathered around his teaching, that Paul believed and he taught a pre-tribulation rapture. That word gathering refers to the rapture. It's exactly what he was talking about in that fourth chapter of his first letter to them when he said, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I, don't, I want you to know something here. I want you to know that Jesus can come back at any moment. It's going to happen at the at the. Uh, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God will be heard. And uh, the dead in Christ, dead believers will be resurrected and they will meet the Lord in the air. And then we which are alive at his coming will be also glorified in our bodies and will meet the Lord in the air. And then we'll both forever be together with the Lord. It doesn't picture him coming to earth in that fourth chapter, but rather rapturing us, catching us up to meet him there in the clouds and then to ever be with him. It exactly matches what Jesus said in John 14. I'm going away. I'm going to my father's house. I'm going to prepare a place for you, but don't worry because I'm coming again. And when I come, I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am in my father's house, so you will be also. That's a reference to the rapture from the lips of Jesus himself. And so this first verse is telling us that before the day of the Lord can happen, the rapture of the church must take place. There's going to be a removal. And once the church is removed from this earth, uh, then I'm telling you, Satan's program will really begin to unfold rapidly. The day of the Lord will follow the rapture of the church, and it will include the time of tribulation. It'll be a time, those seven years will be a time when God will permit Satan to unfold his program, but he will be, God will be using Satan in the process of it. The rapture has to happen before the day of the Lord, before the, the tribulation before the seventh week of Daniel. But I want you to note something else that's related to this rapture. Look at verses six and seven with me, and we'll, we'll go back to the ones we jumped over. <clears throat> Here's what he says in verses six and seven. And now you know what withholdeth, that word withholdeth means restrains, what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. 
For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth or restraineth will let, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So the rapture, the rapture includes a couple of things here. Not only the removal of the church, but also in doing so, the removal, the removal of the restrainer. You'll note in verse 6, the restrainer is referred to in a neuter gender, what? But in verse 7, the restrainer is referred to in a masculine gender, gender he. Satan is incapable of revealing his man, the Antichrist, we would call him. He's incapable of revealing him until the removal of the restrainer. Evil is being withheld currently. And here's how it happens. You remember when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure? He said he was going away. But he said, don't worry, while I'm going away, I'm going to give you my replacement, my substitute, the comforter. He's going to come, and when he comes, he's going to work in you and through you to convict the world of righteousness and, and, uh, and of uh, sin and, uh, of, uh, and of judgment. He's going to convict the world, and he does it through his church. We are the tool that the Holy Spirit uses to bring conviction to this world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. How does he do that? Well, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is permanently indwelt by the Spirit of God. And so it is through our lives and through our lips it's through us that this world is convicted by the Spirit of God. What happens then when the instrument that God's Spirit uses to convict this world is removed? What happens when the Holy Spirit indwelt church is raptured? Well, that would end the church's influence in this world as a restrainer of sin, as the salt of the earth, which we are called to be. And so, don't misunderstand this. The Holy Spirit will be present during the 70th week of Daniel, during that seven-year tribulation period. The Holy Spirit will be present during the day of the Lord, but he will not be restraining evil as he does now through us, the church. And that's why Satan's program of sin, what is called the mystery of iniquity, though it's at work currently, will go into full bore when God takes away the restrainer. Then you'll see what I would say, evil on steroids. You think it's bad now? <laughs> Wait until the church is raptured. You know, they don't know it. But the thing that is really holding a, a culture and society together is the believing church in any nation. That's why they want to get rid of us. <laughs> Because that's why we're the object, we're the target of Satan's attack, is because we're the thing that stands in the way of people just having no restraint whatsoever and doing exactly as they please. And when that happens, well, you can read about it in Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation 19. It's a terrible period of time. Thankfully, we won't be here if we are genuine believers, because the day of the Lord can't happen until, first of all, the rapture. But there's a second thing that has to take place before the day of the Lord, before what we call the tribulation, which is what's being referred to here. <clears throat> Not only must there be a rapture, there must be a departure. Go back to verse 3 with me. And here's what he says. 
let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the day of the Lord, that period of judgment specifically, shall not come except there come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Literally, it's not a falling away, but literally it is the falling away. It's a specific, significant falling away. Now, here's the thing. The word falling away, apostasia, is a word that could be translated in other ways. It could be translated simply departure. So some have said that this falling away, or this departure, if you will, refers to the rapture of the church. And I think that that's a possible interpretation in the context, but I don't think it's probable. I would entertain that, but I don't think it's the most probable interpretation of what this falling away refers to. Although it is a departure, what is it a departure from? Well, when you think of it, the rapture is not an active departure, and this falling away is an active tense. The rapture is a passive type of action. It's something that is performed on the church. It's not something the church does itself. Follow me? And so I do not believe that the departure in verse 3 is referring to the rapture, although I don't fault to uh, good believers that take that position. And I wouldn't argue with them about it either. But I think it's very clear. The word apostasia, translated falling away in verse 3, is a word that outside of the Greek New Testament was used to refer to either a political or a military revolt, rebellion, insurrection, if you will. And every time this word is used in the New Testament as well, it refers to a departure from religious truths. That being the case, and this not being an indefinite, but a definite article, the falling away, it is likely pointing to a significant end time when the one world religion of Antichrist will be in vogue. It's pictured, uh, there's a one world religion pictured in Revelation chapter 17, the picture of the prostitute riding the beast. <laughs> It's one world religion riding the government of uh, one world government of Antichrist. The two get along for a little while anyway. So there has to be a rapture, and then there has to be this departure, this falling away, which I believe refers to a one world religion that will be devised by religionists during that time and eventually will be taken over by this man of sin that is described here. But the third thing that has to take place before the rapture, or before the day of the Lord, not only the rapture, not only the, a, a departure, but thirdly, what I call an exposure. What's going to happen when the church is raptured, when the church does depart, it's going to open the door for the entry of the last great world dictator that we call Antichrist. He's not called that here. He's called by different names here. He's called the, the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He is called in verse 8, that wicked, literally that wicked one, or the wicked one. But this falling away, the rapture, and then this departure, this falling away, will allow Antichrist to enter the scene, to be revealed. And it seems to be a, a, a decisive act at a definite moment in history. 
that's how it's it's uh, explained here. Notice verse three again. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. It's God's perfect time. You remember in the fullness of time, Jesus came forth. Well, in the fullness of time, in God's fullness of time, he's going to allow this to happen. This exposure, this revelation, this uh, a, a, a apocalyptic event of the revealing of Antichrist. Now, I want to I want you to see a little bit about him because this uh, passage gives us some info about him. You'll note, first of all, in verse 4, he opposeth and he exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he exclusively as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. He's talking about the fact that there's been a rapture. There's been a departure, that falling away. Then that wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So right off the bat, in verse 8, I think verse 8 spans the seven-year career of this man of sin. By the way, He's called the wicked, or the wicked one in verse 8. That is a word that literally means a lawless person, a lawless one. He is without law. He is someone who is a law unto himself. And this career of this man of lawlessness, according to verse uh, 4, is just it's a it's a time of unchanging opposition to God and all that is right. He's called not only the man of sin, but in verse three, the son of perdition, and uh, that describes his ruin. It really does, because perdition is to be doomed to destruction. From the time that this man of sin. This wicked one, this son of perdition, by the way, I think that's only applied in one other case to Judas Iscariot. He's a son of perdition as well. But this man who is described as this man of sin, from the time that he makes a covenant with Israel, sometime after the rapture, we don't know exactly when, but in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, it tells us, and, and, and perhaps I should just read this so that uh, we get, again, the picture in our minds. We're told in that verse that he, meaning this man of sin, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or for seven years. And in the midst of that seven-year period, he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation, of course, in the temple, to stop <clears throat> for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation or the end of that seven-year period, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What we have here is the fact that this individual, he comes very stealthily, he comes very deceitfully, he appears on the scene as having the answer to the Middle East peace problem. He has the ability to solve it, so it seems. And his plan enables the Jewish people to build the third temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. How do we know that? There's got to be a temple for him to sit in it, right, in verse 4. To sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this peace treaty that uh, this man of sin, who we call the Antichrist, at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, cuts with the uh, nation of Israel, 
enables them to build the third temple. But as Daniel 9.27 says, in the middle of that seven-year tribulation period, he goes back on his word with Israel. And he breaks the covenant with the nation of Israel. And uh, that's when all hell breaks loose on this earth. That second half of that seven-year period called the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble is the worst time that this earth will have ever experienced. And he will be the one that will be at the center of it all. And God will be using him. But at the end of that seven-year period, he'll be overthrown by the Messiah, Jesus, when he returns at his second coming and uh, at the end, of course, of the tribulation. That Antichrist, that man of sin will be killed. He'll be cast into the lake of fire. And you can read about it in uh, Revelation 19 and 20. And the glorious, shining presence of the Messiah will just immediately and uh, totally immobilize Antichrist's program of one world government and, and that one world religious system, it'll be forever destroyed. That is what we read in that eighth verse. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, he is going to destroy this man of sin who is energized by Satan with all power and signs and wonders. Now look at this. His reign is given to us here, the reign of this man of sin. It's, uh, there's more detail given, but it's, it's a short-lived reign, this world dictator. He's going to be a fake messiah. He's God's enemy. He's going to seek to be worshipped. See what it says in that fourth verse? He's going to sit on the uh, in the temple of God, in other words, on the throne of God, and showing himself that, it, that he is God so that he can be worshipped. He's sitting on Messiah's throne in that third temple. He's sitting in the temple of Jerusalem, and when he does, it will fulfill what Daniel says in that 27th verse, about the, abom the abomination that makes desolate. The temple will no longer be able to be used by the Jewish people. It will be an abomination, and the temple will be cleared out of Jewish wor worshipers as a result. Look at his deception in verses 9 through 11. He, he, he's, in, he's energized by Satan. He has powers and signs and lying wonders. Remember the apostles? They, similar, power, signs, and wonders, but these are lying wonders. He's able to pass himself off as God to be worshipped because he does these godlike miracles. They're powerful miracles. They're significant uh, miracles. They are signs, and they are amazing miracles. They're, they're, they cause people to wonder. His whole program is one of deception. He wants to mislead people to think he's God so that he can be worshipped. You know, behind it, Satan. That's Satan's desire. He always wants to usurp the throne. He always desires to steal and rob God of the worship and the glory that is due the Lord alone. And he's especially effective among people who reject the truth, lost people who refuse to believe. Notice what it says here, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. He has uh, real success with people that refuse to believe. You see... God holds individuals responsible. Our personal choices will either bring us blessing of God or the condemnation of God. And that's what he's saying here. People that refuse, 
He uses his power of deception. He uses his power to delude, to keep people from God, and uh, he to add people to choosing him and his error, to believe what is called the lie, that he, this fake Messiah, is the real Messiah and God. He uses deception. It's a reign of deception, which ends in damnation. Look at verse 12. That they all might be damned. Who? Those that believe the lie of Antichrist. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure, delighted in unrighteousness. You know, it's interesting. In Romans 1, when God declares a society reprobate, and gives them over to their own filthy lusts to do what they want to do. He says they have pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, this is what's being described here. Pleasure in unrighteousness. God actually adds to the delusion of people that refuse to believe. He adds to it. He does this to execute his justice. Those who reject God's truth, those who delight in wickedness, God will enable them to continue down that path of taking pleasure in unrighteousness. He'll give them greater delusion. It's like Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? He was a stubborn, mean, hard-hearted ruler. And he never wanted to let Israel go. He wanted to keep them enslaved. God knew his heart. And every chance that he had, he would, uh, he would refuse. He would harden his heart against what he knew God wanted him to allow the Israelites to do it. And there comes a, a turning point when you look at, at those chapters in the book of Exodus where God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh hardened his, hardened his own heart against God, there comes a point when God says, okay, if that's what you want, I'll give you a hard heart. I'll, I'll go with you. I'll help you to have a hard heart. And that's what we see being played out here in this 12th verse. And it ends in damnation. It begins in deception, but it ends in damnation. And God does this to execute his judgment. Now, does that mean that people who knew the truth before the rapture and didn't accept the truth can't be saved after the rapture? Not necessarily. While there are many Jews and Gentiles that will be saved during the tribulation, the reference here to the lie seems to be a special judgment that occurs at this end time in human history. And it indicates that few people living on earth before the rapture will be saved after the rapture. I'm not saying that none will be that heard the gospel before the rapture, but I'm saying few that heard before will be saved after. You know why? Because the heart always gets harder. The heart always gets harder with age. My heart's a lot harder at this age than it was when I was uh, three years old. The heart always gets harder with age, but on top of that, with each opportunity to hear the gospel and to reject the gospel, the heart gets hard. You know, it concerns me about people that are faithful in attending a church like this that hear the gospel over and over and over again and never really obey it, <laughs> never receive the Lord Jesus, never really get saved. Because as you sit here, if you don't apply the gospel to your life, it's not helping you. It's hardening you. 
whether you realize it or not, you're hardening your heart. If you reject the truth of the gospel, you say, well, I don't understand it. Well, listen to me. Listen to me. If you don't understand the gospel, I'd be glad to take the time to speak with you and make it as simple, as clear, as plain as I possibly can. And the Holy Spirit of God would be glad to attend that and to make the gospel understandable to any human being that truly wants to understand the gospel. My point is, if you are here, whether in person or listening online, and you hear the gospel and you don't properly respond to it, your heart is just getting callous to it. And there is a good chance that you will never be saved and you'll perish. That concerns me. And that concerns any true believer. And I should say this also, even if you are saved, if you hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit of God calls to your heart, uh, I mean, if you hear the word of God preached and the Holy Spirit of God calls to your heart in a particular area of your Christian life that needs to be attended to, and you say, yeah, that's right, but you never do anything about it, you're getting hard. You're getting hard to the truth, even though you're saved, you're hardening your heart like the people of Israel hardened their heart during those years in the wilderness. And so this is a serious matter. It really is. And uh, there's a real program of deception going on. And I don't, I don't want true believers to ever doubt their salvation. You can know for sure that you're saved, right. and you should. You can't live a, a real uh, solid and uh, invaluable Christian life if you're not sure you're saved. But if, you, if you're not sure, now's the time to make sure. Don't deceive yourself, but settle it. Nail it down. Be certain that you're saved. There's a lot of delusion, a lot of fakes out there. Reminds me of the fact that there are fake gems. Anything that is extremely valuable, of course, can be counterfeited. The truth of God can be counterfeited. There are fake gems, and they've been around for thousands of years. But what's interesting is that modern technology for making fake gems has advanced, and now it's difficult even for gymnologists to, to, by their naked eye, spot a fake. And so if you're buying gems today, you have to be aware that there are three types of gems that are made to look more valuable than they are. One is a, there's a synthetic gem. They're lab-grown stones that, uh, they closely duplicate a natural gem's physical and chemical properties. A second category, there are simulated gems that are also man-made. The color of a simulated gem stone may be similar to that of a natural, but it's very different physically and chemically. For instance, cubic uh, zirconia is a well-known diamond simulation. And then a third type of fake gems are what are called enhanced gems, which are natural gems that have been altered in some way to improve their look. Their color can be enhanced through heat or radiation or oils or other chemicals. And there's other methods used to imitate or to enhance the value of stones by dyeing them, waxing them, smoking uh, poor quality stones to make them look richer. So experts advise anyone that uh, wants to buy an expensive gem to have it tested by a lab such as the Gem Gemological Institute of, of America before any sales are final. When you're paying big money for jewels, you want to be very careful that you're getting the genuine thing. How much more? important is it for people to have that kind of carefulness when it comes to the truth? We have to ensure that we're not falling for some heresy. That's right. 
I've done this before, and I'm going to continue to do this. I want to warn you about getting your theology off of the Internet. You may think you know the source, but you'll be deceived very easily. If you're getting your theology, your Bible teaching off of YouTube or off of some uh, internet website, you are putting yourself in real danger because there is a lot of quirks. There's a lot of heresy out there. And you may think you know the Bible well enough to be able to discern truth from error, but I wonder, I think that there are things out there that could fool me. And I've been studying the Bible and theology probably a lot longer than anyone in this room. And the fact of the matter is, it's a danger. I should say this. There's fake gems. Are you a fake Christian? Maybe you sh maybe you shine like a Christian, but are you? Is it real? Are you a fake Christian? Are you following a fake religion? You know how to detect a fake Christian. You know how to detect a fake religion. Does it line up with the simple truth of the Bible? Have you been putting off? getting saved and following Jesus? Well, what's the hardness level of your heart? <laughs> Are you willing to keep taking that chance that you might come to a point where you don't even care? I've dealt with people like that, and I'm telling you, it really is a burden. I've dealt with people that have rejected God all of their life, and here they are in their in their 70s and uh, pushing 80 and their heart is hard as a rock because they've been rejecting the Lord. Don't wait. Don't put it off. You think, oh, someday I'll take care of it. No, you're deceived. You'll never take care of it unless you do it now. Now, Paul says, is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You're not going to get saved tomorrow. <laughs> you got to be saved today while you have the opportunity because you won't have the opportunity in the future. You say, how do you know that? How do you know you won't? You will. <laughs>